There are few things worse than having a loved one abducted. The utter amount of powerlessness that must accompany not knowing where they are, if they're alive or dead, if they're hurt, or if they'll ever come home. Now imagine that the person who is abducted is your fiance, and she's four months pregnant with your first child, and you not only hear it happen, but you see her abductor speeding away with her, but you're unable to catch up. That's the absolute hell that Rob Schaefer experienced on April 4th, 1991, when his fiancee Angela Hammond was abducted from a payphone in Clinton, Missouri, while she was talking to him. Now, nearly 30 years later, many questions remain, including whether or not Angela's disappearance was related to two others around the same time. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Angela Hammond. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Angela Marie Hammond, who went by Angie, was born on February 9, 1971, in Kansas City, Missouri, to Marcia and Chris Hammond. The family of three eventually settled in Clinton, Missouri, where Marcia's parents lived. Shortly thereafter, Marcia and Chris added a little boy to the family. Though Marcia and Chris later divorced, the family still remained close, and Angie had a happy life in Clinton. After Angie graduated high school, she stayed close by and worked as a night processor at a bank while taking classes at Central Missouri State University. While she eventually decided college wasn't for her um, and, you know, was still kind of trying to find herself in that way, her love life was going quite well. When Angie was 19, she met 18-year-old Rob Schaefer, who was the quintessential, like, high school star athlete. Rob planned on joining the military after graduation. The pair fell in love and quickly became inseparable. Soon after they became dating, Angie became pregnant. And despite their young age, the couple was thrilled about having a baby. And Rob proposed and Angie accepted. I've heard conflicting reports after this about whether or not they moved in together or if that was just, you know, the future plan um, and they hadn't done it yet. It sounds like Rob was actually still finishing up his senior year of high school at this time. So I think that, you know, they were still living with their parents at, at this point. Angie was a bright and friendly woman, and it seems like she's one of those like tiny, feisty girls. She was only between 4'11 and 5 feet tall. <laughs> yeah. It's very tiny. I know. And it was 1991, so she had like this huge perm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that made her, what, like 2 feet taller? Yeah, she was probably like 5'8. <laughs> yeah. And an infectious smile. She was well-liked around town and, you know, seemingly had a large group of friends. On April 4th, 1991, Angie had the day off from her bank job, and she and Rob attended a barbecue at her mother's house. And I think it's important to mention at this point that, you know, everybody loved Rob, too. So Rob's family loved Angie. Angie's family loved Rob. Like, yes, the couple was young. Yes, she was pregnant. But everybody seemed to be in favor of everything. After the barbecue wrapped up a little after 9 p.m., Rob needed to return home to babysit his little brother for a few hours while his mother was gone. So Angie dropped him off, and they made plans to meet back up later. After that, Angie met up with her best friend Kyla to hang out while she waited for Rob to finish babysitting. After Angie and Kyla hung out, though, Angie started to feel a little tired. She called Rob to let him know that she was just going to go home and relax instead of meeting up with him. Now, the circumstances around this call are important and have been misunderstood over the years, so I want to make sure that we're clear about exactly what happens after she drops Rob off and makes this call. Angie and Kyla were living the early 90s small town life, and when they hung out, that really just kind of consisted of cruising around the town square because, you know, it, they didn't do anything. It was Clinton, Missouri, 
and there wasn't really anything to do. It was a Thursday at around's, you know, she dropped to Rob off at 10 o'clock. T- 10 a.m.? 10 p.m. Because this is after the barbecue. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so this is like, you know, this is late. So, Ky- so Kyla and Angie just kind of cruise around, hang out, talk for an hour. And then at 11.15, Kyla decided to go home. So she left, and Angie was still downtown because, like I said, they were just cruising around the town square. And so that's when she decided to call Rob. Now, she called him from a phone booth in the nearby food barn parking lot. And she did that because, one, like I said, she was downtown already. Mm -hmm. And her mom didn't have a phone at their house at the time. So it didn't make any sense for her to go home. And And then call him. And then call him, right? Mm -hmm. So she just called him from the payphone there. And I just really wanted to drive that home because, like, a lot of people do not understand why she was calling her boyfriend from a payphone at 11.15 at night. Um, but that's, you know, that's why it, and also Rob lived nearby. So a lot of people saying, well, you know, why didn't she just go over there? But again, if the point is she's tired and wants to go home, like you're not going to go over there and while he's babysitting his little brother, just to say, you're not going to hang out. Right. So she called him and Rob was still babysitting his brother. Um, and Angie told him that she was just going to go home, take a bath and relax and she would see him tomorrow. But you know, they were also still a young couple in love. So this like two minute conversation turned into a 30 minute conversation. Um, and at about 1145, Angie noticed something strange. According to an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, she told Rob that an older truck was circling the parking lot and that the man inside appeared to be watching her. This obviously creeped her out in general, but then the man parked near the phone booths. And I'm going to stop right here and bring up another one of my safety side notes, and it's the same safety side note I've been, I've brought up before because I want to bring up Gavin DeBecker's book, The Gift of Fear just like I did in the Tony Sharpless case, because what I'm about to tell you is a perfect example of what people too often do. They ignore their gut feelings of danger, which Angie was feeling already. As soon as she saw that truck, she was feeling it. So listen to your gut. Where was her friend at this point? She went home. She was just gone. Like So, she, so Angie was calling her boyfriend and then she was going to walk home? No, she had her car. Oh. So she and Kyla, so, so Angie had her car. Um, she dropped Rob off and then she met up with Kyla who also had their car, her car. Okay. So yeah, she and Kyla both had cars. Kyla left. Gotcha. No, I was just envisioning them in the car together. Yeah, but. no, no. Kyla's gone. So Angie's by herself. But again, it's, you know, downtown Clinton, Missouri, very small town. She worked nights too. So, you know, she felt comfortable being out late. Yeah, and she's, you know, in a public place. Yeah. Uh, You know, presumably there's probably a lot of lights there. Right, exactly. Okay, so this is what Rob told Unsolved Mysteries happened next. Quote, he used the phone next to her, got back in his truck, and looked at something with a flashlight. She described the flashlight to me over the phone. He was looking for something. I had her ask him if he needed to use the phone. Maybe the other phone was broken. And he said no, he'd try again in a minute. Then we just talked about other things. We weren't too worried about it. And that's when I heard her scream on the phone. I heard her scream. The only thing that went through my mind was getting up there and finding out what the hell was going on. I just dropped the phone and ran out of the house. I didn't hang the phone back up and just headed up there. End quote. Uh, This is like nightmares. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine hearing that. I mean, it, it all, it's, it sounds like a, like a bad movie. Plot, right. Well, you know? exactly. Yeah. It just sounds completely insane. And it only gets crazier. So Rob's house was only about seven blocks away from the food barn. So he jumped in his car and drove down to see what was going on. But as he was driving, he saw a truck going in the opposite direction. And it was Angie. She screamed, Robbie, as she saw his car. Rob immediately threw his car into reverse and took chase. He followed the truck for a little bit, but apparently when he threw his car into reverse, he did it without stopping, so he completely tore up his transmission. 
When the truck made a sharp right turn, Rob's car stalled out. Oh, my God. Yeah. This really is like the plot of a bad movie. Exactly. I mean, he saw her. That's terrifying. And then, yeah, and his transmission goes out. Yeah, I can't imagine how traumatic this must have been for him. To first hear your pregnant fiancé get abducted on the phone and then to see the guy actually driving away with her only to ultimately lose them. So keep in mind, this is around midnight on a Thursday in a small town before the age of cell phones, so Rob couldn't call the police or anything while he was chasing this truck. And when his car stalled out, he was stuck. Yeah, and I'm... Sure, it was far enough away that he couldn't run back to use the phones at the at the uh, at the food barn food or anything barn. else. Yeah, so he just started heading to the police station on foot. But then, luckily, somebody did drive by and saw him. And I'm not clear as to whether or not it was somebody that he knew or not. But I mean, it was a small town, so probably. Yeah. Um, but that person gave him a ride to the police station. But obviously, they lost a lot of time in that, you know, just simply due to the fact that there weren't cell phones or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Once Rob got to the police station and began to tell his story, he relayed what Angie told him about the man, that he was unkempt with long hair, a beard, and glasses, and he was wearing overalls. The truck was a late 60s or early 70s Ford F-150 that was either green or yellow and had a white top. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to get a license plate number during the chase, but he was able to see that the back window had a decal of a fish jumping out of water. It's a pretty specific description. Um, not that, I mean, that, that truck sounds like a, it might be pretty common in the area, but the decal might might be easier to pinpoint. Well, right. And that's what people thought. And this right now is bringing me straight back to the Cherry Mahan case yeah, this, this with that ski. van, Yeah, you know, and you would side. think that like, how could a van with a huge mural on the side not be found, but it wasn't. And then what I also read when I was researching this is that for whatever reason in the early nineties, like these decals were super popular. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, I remember seeing decals like that on trucks yeah and they're apparently also just really easy to remove too oh so it's different than the van that say the painted mural yeah that right. you would have to paint over these are just like vinyl decals that you could take off with a straight racer if you mm. wanted to clinton police had a mutual aid agreement with other nearby jurisdictions so they immediately notified the henry county sheriff's department and the state patrol And I read an interesting post from somebody who had spoken to a former Henry County Sheriff's deputy who was on the job at this time. And what he said was that, unfortunately, due to the fact that this was midnight on a Thursday, each department only would have had a couple of officers on duty. I mean, even the state patrol. And who knows, like, where those state patrol officers would have been, you know, if they were even nearby. Yeah. So... You know, despite the fact that they did notify these other jurisdictions, it was still relatively easy for this guy to get away. Yeah, to no fault of the. Police. No, it's just again, it's we're we're running up against a lot of bad luck in timing, both the year, you know, in terms of technology and mm-hmm. the time of night, day of week, everything. Yeah, well, and chances are, uh, you know, this guy probably knew that around what time would be the the best time to do something like this. I mean, I'm sure that, I mean, obviously he didn't know about the technology, but I'm sure that he knew there were fewer police officers on duty at that time. And this is definitely a crime of both uh, planning, but also opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, he wasn't specifically targeting Angie until she, got on that phone yeah and that's what it seems like because again this is it's not like angie was getting off of work like she usually did or anything like that so she wasn't this wasn't a part of her routine so this isn't a situation where somebody had been watching her and knew she would be making that phone call at that time right not her specifically exactly i mean he had a he had a, a plan to abduct somebody right and angie was wrong place wrong time yeah 
The next day, volunteers mobilized to search for Angie. Hundreds of people searched along the highway, in woods, abandoned buildings, everywhere over several days, but came up with nothing. Two people who joined the search were Angie's fiancé, Rob, and her ex-boyfriend, 17-year-old Bill Barker. In the days that followed Angie's kidnapping, investigators, of course, interviewed Rob further because, you know, let's be frank, his story does sound kind of insane. Yeah, but I'm sure that they could very easily uh, roll him out. His kid brother was there at the house. Mm -hmm. You know, they could figure out their trace the phone call. Yeah. You know, there are ways that that they could prove his story. Well, exactly. But, you know, they still need to. Oh, you can see why they wanted to absolutely. talk to him. Yeah. He, he's, I mean, obviously, he's going to be the first suspect anyway. Well, yeah, exactly. But then to, to, to have to, a crazy story like right. this. Right. Like, yeah, it sounds sounds completely made up. Yeah. But God. Yeah. It, I, whew. I know. And so they also interviewed Bill, um, the ex-boyfriend, and according to Rob, the FBI agents who interviewed them seemed to imply that they were both somehow involved in Angie's disappearance. Yeah, and so I don't really, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not clear as to how Bill really got involved in this, other than the fact that he was Angie's ex-boyfriend. Possibly trying to just fit a theory. Yeah, I don't know. Quote, they don't think my story is very good, Rob told the Kansas City Star. But I told them everything I know, end quote. The FBI said that everyone was a suspect at that point, but that Schaefer and Barker were interviewed as primary witnesses. Barker spent about three hours with the FBI, and Schaefer spent about five. And Rob and I believe Angie's mother were both given polygraphs mm-hmm. during all this, and the results of the polygraphs were never publicly released. But, I mean, nothing ever came of it, so I'm assuming they both passed. So while it's completely natural that a fiancé with such an unbelievable story would be looked upon skeptically, witnesses did corroborate part of his account. Two people reported seeing a man matching Rob's description sitting in a truck around the payphones prior to Angie's disappearance. Angie's best friend Kyla also corroborated the timeline. Plus, let's not forget that someone picked Rob up on his way to the police station around midnight. Right. So as unlikely as Rob's story may seem, the timeline just doesn't seem to work if he's responsible for her disappearance. Kyla was definitely with Angie until 1115, and Rob was at the police station by midnight. So even if his little brother was lying for some reason about Rob being there with him until 1145 when he took off after Angie... That would still only give him, at most, a 45-minute window to kidnap, presumably kill, and dispose of Angie in such a way that no one could find her, which just doesn't seem possible to me. Even if he, he was conspiring with this, you know, unkempt man. Yeah. Um, just the, the, the fact that he's on the phone with Angie at the payphone. So, I mean, let's keep in mind this is 1991. So the only other way that he would have been able to communicate anything with this man would have been um, call waiting and if he was at another phone. Yeah. I mean, none of it makes any sense. sense. Because again, and Angie wasn't supposed to call Rob at this time. So how could he be? Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it just, to me, there's just no timeline that works. it, It doesn't work. Yeah. As months went on, theories began to emerge about what happened to Angela. One of the first ones was that Angie's kidnapping was related to two other late-night kidnappings in Missouri. On January 19th of that same year, just three months before Angie's disappearance, 42-year-old Trudy Darby was working at the K&D convenience store in Max Creek, Missouri, which is about 70 miles southeast of Clinton. Around 10 p.m., she noticed two strange men loitering outside of the store. She was so concerned about it that she called her son and told him, He told her to stay put and that he was coming over, but when he arrived just 10 minutes later, she was gone. Her coat was still in the store. Two days later, her body was found dumped by a riverbank about 12 miles away. She had been sexually assaulted, robbed, and shot twice in the head. Then a month later, on February 27th, around 10 p.m., 30-year-old Cheryl Kenny was locking up at her convenience store 
but she never made it to her car, which was later found abandoned in the parking lot. Witnesses did a later report hearing screaming coming from the area, but Cheryl was never found. And on that second one, there weren't any witnesses saying there were people outside. No, murdering. nothing. So the MO of the other two uh, incidents involve stores and mm-hmm. people working at those stores. So it's possible that this person thought Angie was working at the at the the food barn the food or something. Barn. Yeah. And, yeah. Maybe that's what he was casing. The food barn and not necessarily Angie. Angie. But noticed Angie. In 1994, two half brothers, Jesse Rush and Marvin Cheney, were arrested for Trudy Darby's murder. Allegedly, Rush had talked about the crime to friends, and one of them called the police and reported it. Police actually ended up setting up recording equipment at this friend's house to get Rush talking again, and he did confess on tape. So the brothers are arrested, and allegedly, while in jail, Rush continued to talk about the crime and confess to other inmates, though apparently only about Trudy, never about Cheryl or Angie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, okay, he did confess on tape at the friend's house, which does that I, I'll give credence to that, but like anytime I hear anything about a jailhouse confession, like I have to. You have to take that with yeah. for what it is. I mean, yeah. What's the uh, what's the jail what's the snitch getting out of it? Yeah, I never I never trust those. But Rush did write a bunch of letters also while he was incarcerated, and he talked about other murders that he and his brother had committed in similar fashions, um, but never with any names. So you have to take that with a grain of salt, too, because, you know, as we have talked about in earlier episodes, you know, serial killers like to brag about murders that or that they may not have committed. Yeah. So this could be a case where, you know, these brothers were just on the, on the cusp of becoming serial Mm -hmm. and, you know, still with the same mentality of serial killers wanting to boast about what they've done and, and what they've gotten away with. Yeah. And the letters, which I've read excerpts of were very boastful, Mm. you know, that was definitely the tone of them. It was like, oh yeah, we did this to all these other. I mean, but they but they were vague descriptions of of Mm -hmm. what they've done and who these people were. So no specifics. To me, that sounds like they're just boasting to get their uh, get their name out there. Yeah, maybe. Eventually, while the two are in jail awaiting trial, Cheney's wife. So this is the brother, not the one who's writing the letters and talking. (laughs) She had previously given him an alibi and said that Cheney was with her the night of Trudy Darby's murder, Mm. but she recanted and told police that he was actually out with his brother. And so facing this new information, Cheney pleaded guilty to the kidnapping and murder of Trudy Darby. Apparently for a time, authorities considered all three of these cases solved. The fact that the three kidnappings took place within such a short period of time and they seemingly caught the people responsible for one of them made a lot of people think that they had basically just solved all three, despite the lack of any direct evidence linking Rush and Cheney to either Cheryl or Angie's disappearances. Yeah, do do either of them own a truck? I, the, I the don't brothers? know. Yeah. I mean, do they do they have a, a late it was you said it was a late seventies? No, it was the late 60s, early 70s. Late 60s, early 70s model truck. Yeah, model truck. Are either of them presumably older, unkempt? Do they wear glasses? Yeah, one of them could theoretically fit that description. Fit the description. But again, there was only allegedly, you know, one man with Angie's disappearance, not not two. Right. And with Cheryl, we have no idea if it was one or two. So it just doesn't. There's, There's not enough to connect them. No, but. Police, again, did think that there was for quite a long time. And because this belief was so pervasive, for years, Angie's case just kind of left the public eye. But in 2009, police announced that they had new evidence in the case and that sometime in the interim, they had cleared Rush and Cheney of being the perpetrators. Well, it sounds to me like, you know, a a cold case detective got it. Yeah. Reviewed some of the evidence and then started a, 
a new investigation. Yeah, exactly. And I found this monster thread on a forum called Sitcoms Online, of all things, uh, that spans years, like years. We're talking 82 pages, years about this case. And around 2009, when this news broke, both Lauren Hammond, who is Angie's little brother, along with Cheryl's son, started posting about their family members' cases. And they had a lot of interesting things to say. One post talks about Russian Cheney, and Lauren says, quote, For a good majority of my life, I have been under the impression that Jess and Marvin were the killers. However, I believe they were just a really great scapegoat for temporarily closing all three cases. I was never convinced they were responsible, and I have to speculate about their involvement in all of these cases. In regard to the letters, I don't blame law enforcement for pinning them to the crimes either. If someone hands you the gold, you will assume it's gold and want to believe it is. It isn't until you create your own hypothesis and determine your own conclusion that you will know whether or not it really was. I think originally they just wanted to believe, as did our families. We all have a common goal in mind, and it's finding the closure we all deserve, end quote. And we see this all the time, especially in wrongful conviction cases. You and I have talked about this. The family gets so invested in finding the bad guy and whatever measure of closure comes along with that, that they have a hard time letting go, even when the evidence does say otherwise. And, you know, I have a ton of empathy for these families. I can't imagine how hard it must be to realize you don't have the answers that you thought you had. Yeah, I mean, everybody's searching for for answers and closure. Yeah, and, and, to, and to get some, like I said, some measure of that. Because I don't think closure is really real. You never no. really get closure. Well, because, no, especially not if if you don't even know what happened to, to the person. Yeah. You, you don't even have a body. Right. So there is there is always going to be the big question mark out there. Exactly. But, you know, they did have this something, you know, but Lauren said that, you know, he said that they thought they had the answers. They thought these were the bad guys. And as difficult as it must have been, you know, I I think it's really impressive that he and his family did seem to be able to let go of that Mm -hmm. and realize that, no, you know, Angie's case is still unsolved and they don't know who did it. I think it's also impressive that they don't blame the cops for for going down that path I mean, yeah and, you know from a law enforcement perspective you know we talk about the the families wanting closure rules well, so do, so does law enforcement mm-hmm. they want and it's not you know we can talk all day about clearance rates or whatever but you know they want to close this case too you know so it is it is very easy to see how they could jump to that that conclusion that these two mm-hmm. were were the killers of all three, especially just from a societal standpoint, you know, it's scary to think that there are multiple people doing kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah in in the, one in state, the same area. right? Yeah. And because every, like all of these were around 70 miles apart, you know, and they were all in small towns in Missouri and I get it. Um, and I, and I think that it's also important. And I do want to point out that every thing that I read that Lauren said, he was very complimentary toward the Clinton police department. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whoever had the case at that time that he was making these posts in 2009. And it was basically, you know, a cold case at that point, but they were still actively investigating it. And he said that they were trying so hard and, you know, that he, as the brother of the victim, you know, really felt that they cared and they wanted to get this solved. So I do want to point that out too, because that's not always the case. Well, yeah. And I mean, we've, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've seen the, uh, the relationship between victims and families it, and law enforcement sour real quick. Exactly. And, and it didn't in this. Good. So this new DNA evidence that they apparently had in 2009, though, didn't uh, really lead to anything. And police never went public to say, like, what the DNA evidence was or where it came from. Yeah, I can't imagine what what DNA evidence there would have been. Yeah, I don't know. And Lauren, you know, because obviously people on this forum forum asked him, and he was like, you know, I can't jeopardize the case and tell you anything. Yeah, of Um, course. Of course. But... In any case, regardless of what it was or where it came from. It didn't lead anywhere. It didn't lead anywhere. 
so after they cleared Rush and Cheney, you know, then, okay, well, if they didn't do it, who did do it? Now they're back to square one. Exactly. And so there have been rumors that another serial killer, Kenneth McDuff, was responsible for Angie's kidnapping. But I can't find any reason for that beyond the fact that he was captured in Missouri in 1992. Um, But there's no evidence that I could see that he was even in the state when Angie was kidnapped. McDuff was a native of Texas, and that's where he did most of his killing. And in December of 1991, the same year Angie went missing, he murdered Colleen Reed, whom he abducted from a car wash in broad daylight. So, I mean, I get it. Like, I guess, like, these kind of brazen abductions are what he did. And so that's, you know, another reason why they thought maybe he could be the one who was responsible. But, you know, in December of 91, he was in Texas. Like, every other murder, you know, seems to have been in Texas. Um, So... There's no real reason to think that he was in Missouri kidnapping Angie. And I, I would ask the same questions. As I don't. Yeah, I don't know about the truck, but description. but he, the description could fit. Okay. Yeah, Kenneth McDuff also mainly targeted sex workers. Mm. Um, so again, I just you know I don't think that it fits. It was kind of rumor, but I don't know that even police took this very seriously. Yeah, and aside from the the abductions in broad daylight or, or out in the open, what, what else does, does he have, uh, victims that, that were never found? Did they find the bodies? I mean, yeah. And and that's the big thing too, you know, going back to the Trudy Darby murder is that how, she was dumped on a riverbank, yes, right? Exactly. And, and you hear that when you have a murder of somebody that you're not personally connected to, that oftentimes the killer doesn't make a big effort to hide the body right. because don't care they don't care. Right. And so it's it would be weird to me that they would just dump her along a riverbank, but then apparently hide Angie and Cheryl so well that, that nobody's never found exactly. 30 years later. Yeah. And that's, and that's not, um, you know, yes, serial killers evolve in how they uh, commit crimes and how they get away with it, but not that quickly. Yeah. And that's a short amount of time to jump from leaving a body out in the open to hiding two bodies that nobody can find. Right. Another theory that seemed to be quite popular among the locals in Clinton, Missouri, is that it was all a hoax. So apparently, a lot of people think that Rob was lying but not for the reasons you may think. The theory around town is that Angie was having troubles at home, and because Rob did love her, he made up this crazy story so she could run away. Okay. Yeah, so... Is there more to this theory, or is that is that it? Like, <laughs> well, okay, no, so that is basically the theory, but there is some evidence that, you know, could lead to this possibility. In October of 1991, so just, you know, a few months after Angie goes missing, a man named Russell Smith visited family in Ulrich, Missouri. Russell was from Lebao, Manitoba, Canada. He didn't know anything about Angie or her disappearance, but when he got to Missouri, he saw her missing posters because they were still everywhere. Mm -hmm. Russell swore that the month before, he had seen a woman matching Angie's description getting inside of a green pickup truck with a white top and a mural on the rear window in Selkirk, Manitoba, Canada. He was so freaked out by this that he contacted Clinton police and reported it. And in response, Clinton police contacted the RCMP and went up to Canada. Now, given the time frame, they thought that it was possible that Angie had given birth. Mm. So they went all around the town to hospitals, to baby stores, to, you know, all of those types of places and showed her photo, but nobody else recognized her. It seems uh, like, like a bit of a stretch there. I mean, I, okay. I, I get where the theory could come about, but Mm -hmm. if, if Rob still loved her so much to come up with this crazy idea for her to run away, why didn't he disappear also? Like, why didn't he go with her? Right, if, right. If they're so in love and that he's willing to make up this story, like, you know, he's 18 at the time. Yeah. 
just go with her. Yeah. Why not? Why don't they just run away together? Well, exactly. And this that doesn't, whole, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't. And in that it would be the same truck with the same decal and the like, right. Yeah. I, no. Now, now she's got Stockholm syndrome and is okay with this guy that abducted her or, or like that, that that's like, that was some long knew. lost uncle or right. something like that. Right. That, he was helping them. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. And so this to me is more far fetched than the actual story of him hearing her get abducted over the phone. I mean, Angie was young, but she was a grown woman. And what grown pregnant woman has the father of her child help her run away to Canada because of problems at home? Yeah. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Plus, I try not to put a lot of credence into someone's reaction after a loved one goes missing, but the Unsolved Mysteries episode on Angie was filmed around six months after her disappearance, and Rob seems absolutely distraught. I watched this and my heart broke for him. So I'm going to just play a short clip. The beginning is the hardest. Because you know you were close enough to get him. But she just didn't get the job done. And you still wake up at night wondering where she's at. Wondering what happened. Wondering if anybody's still looking. You just wonder all the time. I mean, look at that kid. Yeah, he's destroyed. Yeah. Just completely destroyed. Yeah. And you know, I, I obviously watch a ton of shows like this Yeah, and that was, I mean, just watching him, I don't know, for whatever reason, that one in particular really got me just watching him describe losing her like that. And maybe I'm naive, but I just, I can't believe that the, his pain isn't genuine there. And we'll have the entire episode linked on our blog so you can watch the whole thing for yourself. It's also important to note that Angie's family doesn't think that Rob had anything to do with her disappearance. In that episode of Unsolved Mysteries, Angie's mother states unequivocally that Rob was not involved, and she knows that he feels responsible, but she doesn't blame him. But to me, what's even more important is that the family still doesn't think that Rob had anything to do with it. Because a lot of time in cases like this, we see family members initially believe that people are innocent, and then end up making accusations down the road. Right. And that's typical because they're searching for answers. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes new evidence does come up. Point in different directions. Right. Um, But that didn't happen here. And when Angie's brother, Lauren, was posting in that forum I mentioned earlier, he made some all caps posts that unequivocally state that Rob had nothing to do with Angie's disappearance. And this was in 2009. So we're talking decades later. You know, they still think that he... That what happened, what he said happened, happened. Yeah. But now, nearly 30 years after her horrifying kidnapping, there's no real evidence about where Angie could be. Six months after her disappearance, Rob followed through with his plans and joined the National Guard. Her best friend Kyla moved to Colorado, and everyone else tried to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. But they're still out there, and they still want answers. As Angie's mother said on Unsolved Mysteries, quote, If anybody out there sees anything, if they could put themselves in our place and know how we feel and how heart-wrenching it is that she was taken, even if the guy that took her sees this, if he would just call and let them know what he did with her, end quote. Get this family closure. Get Rob closure. You know, he's been living with this since he was 18 years old. Yeah. And and I'm sure it devastated him. Oh, God, of course. I cannot imagine being an 18-year-old kid seeing your pregnant fiance getting ripped away from you. Yeah. And then that's it. No answers. None. And Rob did eventually, like I said, he joined the National Guard. He, you know, so he moved to Virginia for a time to do that. Um, And he eventually did settle back in Missouri about an hour away from Clinton and did get married and start a family. But you know, which is good because you want him to have a life, but you're right. I can't imagine how hard this must have been to live with the entire time. I'm sure it's still 
troubles him. Yeah, and you know, and the whole family too, because obviously Lauren is still out there. The parents are still out there. You know, they started a Facebook page yeah. for Angie back in the MySpace days. They had a MySpace page <laughs> for her. You know, they're not letting this go. And nor should they. And so we need somebody who has information, who saw something, who might think that they know something to come out and call. Angela Marie Hammond has been missing since April 4th, 1991. She would be 49 years old today. If you have any information about what may have happened to her, please contact the Clinton Police Department at 660-885-5561. You can see all of the sources for this episode, along with photos and videos, on our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social. And then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. We'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And then they were gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!